All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, it's Sunday. I'm here with Kathy on the phone. I'm gonna place, uh, I think, just let me know if you can hear. Kathy, I think I'm gonna place the phone right here on the computer. So hopefully that works well. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Health. We deal with chronic autoimmune problems, chronic neurological issues. Those of you who have chronic pain syndromes, you probably will benefit from watching our videos. At least we think you would. So today we're talking about autoimmune hepatitis and we're gonna go through this condition. I talked about it the other night a little bit, but Kathy is so good at bringing in the lay approach. And so we're gonna try to meld the two uh, this morning and, and go from there. So good morning to everybody who's joining. And Kathy, what were your thoughts? Well, let's get started with exactly what is autoimmune hepatitis. Autoimmune hepatitis. Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and where do my markers go? Excuse me, everybody. I'm just stepping out of view. Autoimmune hepatitis really deals with the immune system attacking the liver. Many of you have heard of hepatitis. Relative to hepatitis, you're thinking of the infectious forms of hepatitis, hepatitis A, B, C, potentially D. And those infectious hepatitis issues sometimes can result in liver cancer. Uh, they're not something that a lot of people want to deal with. Particularly vitamin, or excuse me, hepatitis A can cause that acute uh, foodborne illness that some of you are aware in terms of outbreaks when you eat out. Uh, many of you are aware of uh, cirrhosis affecting the liver. Fatty liver has gained attention. Fatty liver happens in individuals who basically have a high carbohydrate diet, a high fat diet, and they start to store fat in their liver and that can lead to types of cirrhosis. But autoimmune hepatitis is something that I've seen quite a bit of in my practice. And it's not always thought of on the differential diagnostic list very high, but because at Gateswood to Health, we largely deal with patients who have autoimmune problems. Autoimmune hepatitis is something that I seem to see a lot of. So that's what it is. Okay. Yep. So what, why are we talking about it today? What all does it encompass? <clears throat> we're talking about it because I've had a number of patients who have had gastrointestinal problems that were chronic, who had seen, quote unquote, all the doctors, and they didn't have a solution. They didn't have an answer. They thought they had, you know, this condition or that condition. And we ran the testing and it demonstrated that they actually had autoimmune hepatitis. So then from that, it's a not a well understood condition out there, particularly why it happens or how something like diet can dramatically affect it. And so that's why we're talking about this. So what's the standard medical treatment for patients with autoimmune hepatitis? The standard medical treatment mainly consists of drugs that are gonna calm down the immune system. Azothioprine is one, um, prednisone derivatives are the other. So I believe, I don't know if they use pedesonide or not, but definitely prednisone as well as azothioprine. And so basically just medications that shut off your immune system. And good morning to everybody who's joining from all over the country. Mm -hmm. So why are functional treatment options gaining acceptance? What's, what's different with them? Well, what the current research is showing is that there's a huge correlation between this entity called leaky gut. Again, for the record, I hate the term leaky gut syndrome, but it is the term that's being used throughout the literature now and that other doctors are saying. So with leaky gut syndrome, in essence, what we have is that pieces of bacteria break off, they get through the gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream. Also, the little proteins that bind each intestinal cell together can break down. These are referred to as occludin and zonulin. And these proteins have been shown to be reduced in autoimmune hepatitis patients. Also, pieces of bacteria breaking off going into the bloodstream. That has been shown to happen at a very high rate in patients with autoimmune hepatitis. So that's also important. Now, the reason why we're really talking about it is because one of the world's foremost researchers on this condition, Dr. Sezaha at the Mayo Clinic, he is basically saying 
this is a gut problem. This being autoimmune hepatitis, it is a gut problem. He's saying we need to look outside the medications because there's so much research on how your intestinal bacteria can affect how your immune system interacts with the liver. So that's why we're talking about it. And going further, as Kathy and I have discussed in other broadcasts, the intestinal bacteria of the average American has become skewed. It's become more inflammatory, but also this can be heavily changed by what we eat. So if we eat really inflammatory foods, high carbohydrate, high saturated fat foods, then these bacteria shift towards an inflammatory profile. But if you're eating largely a vegetable-based diet, these bacteria can shift to a less inflammatory state and be much more healthy. So we have those components. And then, Kathy, I was going to go a little deeper into some of the, the nuanced biochemistry. Do you think we're good to do that at this point? Sure. Okay. So relative to this, we have the pieces of bacteria coming into the bloodstream. Now, this can activate something I mentioned the other night called a toll-like receptor, and particularly toll-like receptor 4. So this is just a little receptor saying how many pieces of bacteria or what pathogens are coming into the bloodstream. Now, when that happens, that causes toll-like receptor to release something called NF-kappa-beta. This guy is like the evil dictator of your immune system. So once this guy gets activated right at the gastrointestinal immune interface, he will talk to your CD4 cells. CD4 cells are a type of T cell. And the CD4 cells, when they are primed because of NF-kappa-beta, you're going to start making different subsets of T cells. Some of you have heard me talk about Th1, Th2, Th3. There's also something called Th17, which is highly inflammatory. And so what will happen is, is that basically, for all intents and purposes, your immune system will become imbalanced. And so when you have an imbalanced immune system, that can lead your immune system to attacking you rather than the bacteria. Examples of dominant Th1 conditions are rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. Examples of dominant Th2 conditions include what lupus is thought to be Th2, as well as allergies, asthma, things of that nature. Now, one of the critical factors in our body that's trying to regulate the balance of these different types of T cells is vitamin D. Vitamin D, there's a lot of notoriety about vitamin D, and vitamin D now is being shown to be massively deficient in autoimmune hepatitis patients. So much so that Dr. Sazaha has come out and said that low vitamin D, very low vitamin D, is a biomarker for autoimmune hepatitis, like almost a, basically it's just a lab test. If it's really low, doctors really need to be thinking about autoimmune hepatitis in the differential. So that's pretty exciting research in and of itself. Kathy, does that kind of make sense from the yeah. standpoint? Um, and we talk so much about the autoimmune situation and what's going on. And uh, from what you're just saying, and we're talking about the different bacteria that break off and the leaky gut and so forth, I find it extremely interesting that so much of this goes on, but it, remo it results in so many different types of syndromes and symptoms for people, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's going to be the RA or whether it's going to be hepatitis, whether it's going to be MS or whether it's going to be lupus. Is there research that shows us that there's certain types of bacteria that get through that cause, I mean, there has to be something that makes it RA as opposed <clears throat> to lupus. Uh, absolutely, yes. So for lupus, they're showing that it's Enterococcus gallinarum, so it's one type of bacteria. Whereas for RA, it's more Prevotella species and a mouth bacteria referred to as Porphyromonas gingivalis. And then a urinary bacteria called Proteus mirabilis. So yes, there are certain bacteria that are being identified with certain conditions. Now, when it comes to autoimmune hepatitis, I put this FTSZ. This is a 
a protein that's in a lot of intestinal bacteria. And this protein basically is identical to something called beta tubulin. And the beta tubulin cross reacts with this thing called ANCA antibodies. So basically, when you have pieces of bacteria, it's called molecular mimicry, and I've talked about it in other broadcasts, but molecular mimicry basically designates when things look alike, that can initiate the immune system to attack them. So in essence, these antibodies are seen between 47 and 92% of autoimmune hepatitis patients. So they're seen often. And they're seen often because basically pieces of bacteria are getting through the gut, causing them to form. That's the current thought process. So okay. there's not a specific there a bacteria for autoimmune hepatitis, but you know, just generalized bacterial translocation through the gut will cause this. Does that make sense, Kathy? Okay. Yes, it does. And it still spawns the question in the back of my mind of, is there an actual link? And there may not be research to show this, but can there be a link between, I mean, we're talking about carbohydrate, fatty diets, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if a person is looking at their diet, and maybe mm -hmm. their family has um, are predisposed to some of these conditions. Maybe we see that a lot in autoimmune, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. um, is there a link? I mean, do we actually have specific stuff that says, okay, if this is what you eat all the time, I mean, this is what you're going to see. This is the bacteria that you're going to create, and this is what's going to break through and get into your bloodstream. I mean, does it go that far? It does to a certain extent. So I really like the genetic question because a lot of people with autoimmune hepatitis think, oh, it's just genetic. That's what my doctors told me. It's a genetic issue. That's why I developed it. And because of the genetic issue, that's why I have to take meds. Well, when we talk genetics, what are we talking? In actuality, the genetics that predispose somebody to autoimmune hepatitis are autoimmune genes. So there's something called MHC that is on our immune cells. I put APC because it stands for antigen presenting cell. And so if your major histocompatibility complex, MHC, is such that you are genetically predisposed to kind of overreact when pieces of bacteria come through, that can genetically be associated with autoimmune hepatitis and other autoimmune diseases. Does that kind of make sense, Kathy? Yes, it does. Okay. <clears throat> and then when you were saying how does really diet affect all of this, the main thing seems to be these pieces of gram-negative bacteria that get through the gastrointestinal interface and they cause activation of this toll-like receptor 4. What does that mean? In essence, gram-negative bacteria overgrow when we eat something like the standard American diet, high-carb, high-saturated fat. You eat that, these guys overgrow, then they start breaking off, going to the bloodstream. They're highly associated with blood sugar dysregulation, prediabetes, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. And then that leads to activation of the toll-like receptor 4, which then leads to this whole process. So that would be my answer on that. Okay. Yeah. I think I guess that's a good, good overview of everything, doesn't it? I think so. So I'll probably be doing more videos with Kathy on autoimmune hepatitis. We'll try to kind of wrap this together. But thank you all for joining. Really appreciate it. Sunday morning. It's early, I know. And uh, hope you all have a happy Sunday, and we'll see you next week. All right.